All right, everybody, welcome back to part two of Napoleon's greatest foe. In part one, we found out that his greatest foe is actually Sir Sidney Smith of the British. He was kind of like a cross between, uh, well, he was first and foremost a naval officer, but as Lindy Beige pointed out, he does have some other characteristics of like army, kind of like is a mixture of a few things. Anyway, we learned a lot, or I learned a lot about Napoleon in the last video, particularly kind of like his uh, meaner side. <laughs> that uh, I don't think had been really pointed out to me in previous videos before. A lot of you in the comments told me that I needed to be careful about Lenny Beige because he is kind of uh, biased against Napoleon or he has a certain views on things and so I needed to kind of take what he says with a grain of salt. I guess every historian is probably biased in some way. But before we get into the video, we're going to do comment time. I'm going to bring up a few of your comments that kind of touched on some of my questions in part one. If you want to skip this, click the reaction chapter and go straight right there, but let's do comment time. First comment comes from David Hyams. The point about Sidney Smith being promoted on merit, I think, to contrast what was happening in the Royal Navy with the way you got the promotion in the British Army at the time, which was you're purchasing a higher rank promotion by merit in the Army was very rare, which is what makes Sharp in the novels and TV films unusual. Well, for those of you who don't know, I have been watching Sharp over on Patreon. We've done the first two episodes of the Sharp series over there. And that point was brought up actually in one of the episodes. The officers often got promoted based on, well, basically they could like buy their way into a promotion versus on merit. And I do remember that, that point being brought up. I guess that would uh, explain some of the younger officers particularly guys like Sir Sidney Smith. Eric Taylor says, actually there was an expectation of decent treatment for prisoners of noble rank. They were treated quite well and often given large rooms or an entire building. They might share the buildings, but being a POW at this time wasn't that bad so long as you were a noble. All right, well, I, I guess, you know, prisoners today, even if you're like a movie star or something like that, I feel like you probably get treated a little bit better than the, you know, typical prison population. Uh, it, it is interesting to know that they, you know, would treat you much better even give you like your own building and stuff. That's crazy. Marley Katanek says the siege of Kueta, Kyota, Siuta can tout itself as the longest siege in recorded history. The first phase of the conflict lasted a staggering 26 years, during which the Moroccan forces fought with the inhabitants of the Spanish-held city on the northern coast of Africa. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I mentioned the siege of three months being a long time, and I thought, well, there's probably going to be a longer siege out there, right? I did not expect it to be 26 years, though. I was expecting maybe, like, a year or two max. How is there anybody left alive <laughs> after a siege of 26 years, though? Uh, Blame Than says, if you you think that's young for an officer on the ship. And we're talking about uh, Smith, who was 16 as an officer on the ship. Wait till you see Master and Commander next week in Meet the Midshipmen. It was normal for children to be giving orders to enlisted crewmen. The class system, again, inherited social class more than anything defined the officer corps. Also bear in mind the lifespan thing is exaggerated. It wasn't unusual for people to live to 70, 80, or 90 back then. It was just that the average is misleadingly dragged down because so many people die of childhood diseases before the age of five. So there were some other comments that said that there could be like 12 year olds, you know, giving like in charge of the gun deck or something, giving orders. And there were also other comments that talked about um, how the lifespans were kind of like the same they are today. It's just that a lot more children died. I appreciate you pointing those out to me. By the way, we will be watching Master and Commander over on Patreon on April 22nd. It's not next week, but April 22nd. As uh, Blame Thin mentioned, we do movie nights over there and Master and Commander is up next for movie night. And we, it's, we do it as a live stream so you guys can join a uh, chat you know, in real time. And we can chat during the movie and everything. So we're all uh, we're all watching it together. And if you're interested in that, my Patreon link is in the description of this video and the pinned comment as well. Uh, lastly, we have Stevie Budin or Budin. The Knights Templars were an order of knights slash monks who were created to help and protect pilgrims 
traveling from Europe to Jerusalem, specifically to Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, hence the name. Oh, Templars were referring to the temple in Jerusalem. <laughs> okay. I thought it was more of a unit of time, like temporary. They grew to have an immense money and power despite or even because of an oath of poverty and are created with inventing an early form of banking. However, power attracts enemies and they were disbanded a few years later officially. There are, however, unofficial histories slash conspiracy theories, which claim all sorts of things about them, some of which were used by Dan Brown for the plot of the Da Vinci Code, which may be where you've heard of him. I don't, I've never uh, read or watched the Da Vinci Code, so I wouldn't have heard of him from that. I think it's just, you know, out there in the ethers. It's one of those terms that uh, has come up and I've heard before. All right, that'll do it for your comments. I appreciate you guys leaving them. I do read through all of your comments, even though I don't bring them up here during comment time. But we're gonna go ahead and get into the video now. We left off, basically Napoleon had abandoned his like Middle East or slash Asia campaign. He decided that he wasn't going to go into Istanbul and try and, you know, reconquer what Alexander the Great had conquered. So he went back to France. That left uh, a lot of his troops still there in Egypt. I believe it was Egypt or it was it was in the Middle East somewhere. And uh, his the guy in charge of the French troops there, uh, Claiborne, I think was his name, had to make a deal with Sir Sidney Smith. So Sidney Smith made that deal with him and that's kind of where we left off. So we're gonna pick it up there and let's see what else Lenny Beige has to say about Napoleon. And the Turks were quite happy with that. Uh, the Turks, the Turks, uh... Were cock a hoop. They were they were so happy, in fact, with uh, the way uh, that the British got rid of the French uh, that um, uh, one of the many little consequences of this is that uh, a chap called Elgin uh, got uh, uh, the permission to uh, remove. He did actually have to pay quite a lot of money for them as well, but he was he got permission to remove some statues from a, a temple on a on a hill in Athens. Uh, these are now known as the Elgin marbles, and you can see them in the British Museum. And if anyone tells you that they were stolen. Uh, or they weren't. They were paid for and they had permission. And at the time, um, Athens was a city that was in a country called Turkey, so you dealt with the Turks. Anyway, so, sorry, another little, another little sort of side snippet of history there. Um, so I didn't know that Athens was ever in Turkey. <laughs> Obviously not the modern borders of Turkey, but okay. I, I just uh, always thought Athens was in Greece and it never changed hands. The effect of what was going on. So, why would Sir Sidney want, particularly Claybert and 18,000, and a, whole, a largely intact French army, to go back to France? Well, he saw Claybert as a good bulwark against bulwark against Napoleon, because he saw Claybert as an honourable, ardent, genuine Republican, and someone who was not at all a friend of Napoleon's, and someone who, like Sir Sidney, saw that Napoleon's ambitions were really dangerous to the point of deranged. Um, so if Clébert had gone back to, uh, to uh, France and arrived, this very, very popular commander with an army loyal to him because this army saw how he had looked after them, whereas Napoleon had definitely not looked after them. Um, th he would have then perhaps have been a very good counter to Napoleon's rise in to power within uh, France. This treaty, which had been signed, agreed by the Turks and uh, the, the French alike, uh, and the Mamluks, everyone was happy. Mamluks were the people who were r running uh, Egypt. Uh, but they were actually subservient, at least in nominally, to the Sultan of uh, the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, um, got, it got countermanded. Uh, Lord Keith, who was running the show, he was the, 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 the chief uh, at the time, uh, and in, he was in, in agreement with Nelson, said, you can't have Sir Sidney just carrying on like this and making decisions like this and dealing with the enemy like this, and, and you know, no one's given him permission to do any of this. So it was countermanded. The deal was off. And Sir Sidney, now of course, when you uh, agree to surrender to, to someone and uh, you agree that you, you agree kindly to be transported away by him under his protection, uh, you are asked to do things like vacate the fortresses that you're occupying and so forth. It's, you know, it's only right and fair. Um, but that was the deal. And Sir Sidney, when he knew that the deal was off, he sent word to Clébert saying, I think you better reoccupy those forts because I'm afraid uh, I can't give you the protection that I, uh, I thought I was going to be able to give you. I'm sorry. Now you could say that that was a very honourable thing he did, or you could say he was being treacherous to his own nation. 
Um, I, I'm inclined towards the former of those two, though I, I do see that there's an argument for the latter. Um, anyway, so then that meant that it all had to be done again, but this time by force. So, um, so Sidney was sent to uh, southern Turkey to rehearse an unusual thing, an opposed landing. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a character who turns up at this point in the story. He's actually pretty irrelevant to the story, but he's just an extraordinary character. I think I may as well just throw him in. Um, the local ruler, uh, where they were rehearsing uh, the, the, the opposed landings, or incidentally, as Sir Sidney designed a landing craft for the purpose, um, when he, this, this nut brown grizzled guy with a big beard and swathed in the, the, the big you know, cloth garments of, uh, of the locals, uh, when he saw some Highlanders in Sir Sidney's forces, he addressed them in Gaelic. It turned out that his name was Campbell and he was from Argyleshire and that he got into a bit of trouble in Argyleshire so decided he better skip town for a bit and go adventuring and he ended up fighting against the Russians for the Turks and he got his nose cut off and uh, had a silver one made to replace it, <laughs> oh uh, which he gosh. had painted flesh-coloured. Tick, tick, tick. Um, I don't know, a bit weird. It's one of those characters who, if you saw him in a film, you go, oh, no, come on, that's ridiculous. But there, sometimes uh, history is stranger than fiction. Anyway. By the way, I want to see uh, Sir Sidney Smith's landing craft, because I guess that was a very unusual thing to do back then, was to do, like, a... I mean, I, I have, like, the D-Day landing or the Gallipoli or something like that on mind. It would be interesting to see what he came up with. Uh, he rehearsed for the opposed landings there, and when they reckoned they'd, they'd got, it, uh, got it sorted, it went ahead. And it was a successful opposed landing, but a very costly one. Fighting the French under these circumstances was very difficult. Opposed landings are always difficult. The British suffered 600 casualties in the first half an hour of fighting. Um, but they did manage to get inland. Uh, Sir Sidney himself uh, was in the thick of it. Uh, he actually uh, fought so hard that he, uh, his sword broke and uh, he was in command of getting uh, the, the, the naval forces ashore and what they were doing and getting the guns ashore and during the battle itself actually the use of those naval guns on shore. Um, so it is perhaps a little unfair that he wasn't mentioned in any of the uh, write-ups of the uh, how the battle went written up by the, uh, the British army officers at the time which um, Ah, seems a little, as I say, a little unfair. Uh, anyway, uh, one interesting thing that happened during this battle was uh, when the French heavy cavalry smashed into the British line. Um, what, what was meant to happen in those days is when the heavy cavalry smashed through a, a line of infantry, that line of infantry is meant to flee in panic and scatter and no longer be an effective fighting force. That's it. You, you sweep away a line of infantry with your cavalry. Only what happened uh, at this point was that the French cavalry charged at them and the, the British uh, shot at them and then they went smash through the line and the British then turned around and carried on shooting which you're not supposed to do you're not supposed to do you're supposed to scatter you, you got it wrong there but anyway uh, so the British defeat the French again and um, forced them <laughs> to sign a surrender and would you believe it the terms of the surrender were the same as at the conference of El Arish so if they had just let uh, so Sidney just do what he had, had done, then 20,000 lives would have been saved. 20,000 men died in that campaign who would have been otherwise alive. Um, and other nasty things happened. For instance, the, the Turks um, sent, over, uh, sent over a force which um, uh, massacred a load of Coptic Christians. Uh, so Sidney himself rushed when he, he, he found out where they were going in the uh, Rosetta mouth of the, the Nile um, uh, to save the Coptic, but he was there too late and the deed had been done. You see those Coptic Christians made the mistake of worshipping the same imaginary friend in a very slightly different matter, uh, manner. So obviously, obviously they had to die. Anyway. Okay, he obviously doesn't like God either, <laughs> or doesn't believe in God. So, now Instead of a, uh, a unified large army of 18,000 French under a commander going back to France and possibly acting as a bulwark against as a counter to Napoleon, instead a half-sized shattered remnant of an army without its leader went back to France because Kleber was assassinated. We are told by an Arab student, but an awful lot of people will have wanted Kleber dead, so who paid the student? Uh, it's a little bit suspicious, but anyway, Kleber unfortunately was dead. His body was shipped back to France, but Napoleon didn't allow it to land because Napoleon was a git. Um, 
And so that uh, that came that came. I watched the 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 one of the recent episodes of Black Adder that I watched on Patreon. It was the second episode of season two, and uh, he used that term "get" in there, and I was like, I don't know what that means. So you guys let me know that um, it's kind of like a another way of saying that he was a an a hole, basically. At least when I hear that term now from uh, the British, I know what they're talking about. Um. And so that uh, that, cam that campaign uh, ca came to a close. And uh, again, um, uh, our man found himself at a bit of a loose end. He, he went back to Britain uh, for a bit, uh, where he found that he was ridiculously old-fashioned. Uh, his clothes, uh, he was so old-fashioned, he looked positively French. That's how out of date he was. Uh, you know, <laughs> floral waistcoats and tailcoats and cravats were in now. And Oh my goodness, man, we we'll have to get you some, some decent clothes. You can't... I guess that's an insult to the French. Not right like that, what do people think? Um, he was, unfortunately, broke. You see, the Foreign Office had disavowed what he'd done uh, in signing the, the con at the conference of um, uh, El Arish, uh, and so the, it was felt that he couldn't be paid. So he didn't get any money for any of the things he'd done. He had just thwarted Napoleon's uh, entire campaign in the East uh, with his amazing defense of Acre and he was broke, but people knew about what he'd done, and a lot of uh, supportive members of the general public, with whom he was tremendously popular because he was a great hero, uh, they saw that he was he was all right. Um, and uh, a number of other things happened in his life. He got married. He, he became the MP for Rochester for a bit. Um, and uh, uh, oh. I just remembered, I, I was going to read from this book a letter that he wrote to Napoleon. I don't want, it's somewhat out of uh, sequence now, unfortunately, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a good letter. Um, so this was uh, after Napoleon's defeat uh, at uh, Acre. Uh, Napoleon hasn't actually left the area yet, so it's quite easy to get a letter to him. And of course, everyone knew in uh, Napoleon's staff that a letter from Sir Sidney had arrived. And um, it said, General. I have known for some days that you've been planning to raise the siege. I, who have no cause to love you, uh, to say the least of it, uh, should never have said so, but circumstances have led me to wish that you should reflect on the instability of human affairs. Would you ever have thought that a poor prisoner in the cells of the temple, that an unfortunate man on whose behalf you refused to interest yourself for a moment when you were in a position to do him a signal service, for at that time you were all powerful, would you ever have thought, I say, that that same man would be- It's a little annoying that he keeps putting these big paragraphs on top of him talking. So I gotta pause it to read. Um, I've been kind of reading them as he talks, but this one's too long. Napoleon, unable to withstand the loss of phase, lied to his men and told them that the letter was a challenge to a duel and that he had replied that he would accept if the Duke of Marlborough to duel him instead. Become your opponent and force you in the sands of Syria to raise the siege of a miserable little town. These are events, you must admit, that surpass all human calculations. Believe me, General, you must adopt a more modest line of thought. And the man who tells you that Asia is not a theatre created for your glory will not, in fact, be your enemy. This letter is a small revenge that I now allow myself. <laughs> anyway. Uh, sorry that that came a little bit out of order. So, he's become MP, Rochester has got married, yeah, he's done various other things. Um, and uh, he now uh, looks around for other avenues. And again, he visit, visits places like Spain and Portugal and does more uh, looking at diplomacy and so forth. And he gets interested in a campaign in, well, first in Sicily, and then he widens it to, to Italy. Now, he didn't actually have orders to do all the stuff that he did in Italy because he was one of these people who thought that if you want to defend this place, uh, rather than just cluster around that and wait for the, atta the attacker to mass at his leisure and then at a time of his choosing, attack at a point of his choosing, much better to defend this place by attacking the enemy in lots of other places where the enemy is. So we're the Royal Navy, so you know, rather than wait for uh, Napoleonic forces in, in, in Italy to, to mass and attack Sicily, let's, let's go up and down around Italy and just generally cause havoc, uh, creating little forts and so forth. There's quite a few times... Um, uh, he would create a fort, sometimes sacrificing one of the ships of a fleet. So he would turn up and then just beach a ship, take all the guns off it and use the wood for the ship. And so the ship would very quickly whoosh, turn into a fort. You want a fort very quickly? 
sail up with a ship and turn the ship into a fort. Bingo. Okay, you've got one uh, ship fewer in your in your fleet, but hey, a fort which you can then can uh, uh, be used as a base uh, for later operations. And uh, he used this in um, isles off small islands off France a number of times. Anyway, sorry, another sidetrack. Um, Napoleon, um, oh yeah, that's right, and he fought at the Battle of Maida, is quite significant. So there was the Battle of Maida, which was uh, 1806, and this seems to be quite a significant battle. Uh, he uh, himself became leader of the Massey. Uh, he became leader of partisans in the area. Uh, he seemed to be very good at winning over locals and turning them against the French. Um, and at the Battle of Maida, which was a decisive victory for the British, uh, he used partisan forces in the rear of uh, the French. Uh, he used um, naval vessels off the coast that were aiding in the battle as it was going on. Uh, so again, this was land and by sea, terra marique uh, operation. Uh, and uh, I don't know quite how involved he was in the tactics of the battle itself with regard to letting, uh, say, um, the infantry involved. But it does seem to have been very significant for uh, one reason being that uh, one Arthur Wellesley did a very detailed study of this battle to see how do we beat the French, particularly on land. And he was very impressed by a number of things. He was very impressed by the cooperation of naval forces on land and ships at sea cooperating with the army on land and how effective they were. He also learned an awful lot about how partisans could be used uh, in uh, situations such as this. And he also, according to most historians until recently, looked at how the French attacked in column and the British defended in line and how the line, British line against the French column uh, tactic was very, very effective. And he concluded that unless the French changed their tactics, uh, well, he'd be able to beat them. Uh, now, uh, he keeps saying, he keeps using the term partisan. What exactly is a partisan? More modern revisionist historians have said that mm, there's a problem with that. As far as we can tell, the French really did not use column very much in this battle. They were deployed almost entirely in lines, so maybe that's a detail which is not quite right. But even so, this Arthur Wellesley chap went on to do terribly well for himself, and you may know him by a, a, a title that he got uh, later, the first Duke of Wellington. And of course, a lot of, a lot of these, these tactics became his... his uh, his bread and butter in the Peninsular War, which was coming later. Um, France uh, decided with Spain, well, Napoleon, uh, in, in um, conjunction with the Spanish, decided that they were going to partition Portugal between them, and Portugal didn't like that idea, and Portugal and Britain were allies, and so uh, Britain got involved in the, in, in the Peninsular War. And uh, Sir Sidney was actually a bit involved with that, he went to Lisbon and so forth, but I don't want to dwell on that part of the story. Um, other than perhaps to mention at this point that an awful lot of partisans uh, fought very effectively uh, against the, uh, the French in uh, Spain and uh, the Git um, uh, um, Napoleon seized all his allies, well seized all his allies major forts. Okay, yeah let's do a deal to partition this other uh, country between us. Yeah I'll send over a, an army to help you with that and oh I seem to have seized all your forts my ally and oh I think I'll actually install uh, my brother as, as, as king of Spain and uh, Anyway, he was just a, a, a git beyond imagining. However, however bad you think Napoleon was. See, I really have very little, very little in common with people who think that Napoleon was a great man. He was a great man in that he achieved a staggering amount of harm. And if, if that's a way to measure uh, greatness, then, oh, OK, yeah, a great man. Uh, but um, what good did he actually do the world? Oh, he introduced the metric system. Well, one, he didn't introduce the metric system. Uh, uh, he, he, admittedly, it was introduced, you know, at one... Okay, we're going on a Napoleon rant now. <laughs> well, he was in charge, but he himself actually hated the metric system. Uh, and two, it's the metric system. How is that good? No, um, he was responsible for... He doesn't like the out. metric system. <laughs> okay, he doesn't like Napoleon. He doesn't like the metric system. He doesn't like the French. And he doesn't like the concept of God. What else is he going to come up with here? <laughs> I know he's probably joking with some of this stuff, but... ...amounts of completely unnecessary death. He was uh, duplicitous and incredibly uh, touchy, in incredibly... Um... Sir's letter to him from the Temple Prison was published and many people went there to see it on the shutters. Okay. Uh, Napoleon had the prison demolished to stop it from becoming too big of an embarrassment. Where's the Temple Prison though? What are they talking about? Was it in Spain or Portugal or something? Sorry if he mentioned it in this, it's just there's a lot of information coming in. You know, here's my thing about Napoleon, and I've said it 
in previous videos too that history is really black or white and you know trying to say he's either good or bad is probably not accurate he's probably a combo of the two but I mean, he brought up the metric system here but i've had a lot of you tell me that he did you know a lot more than that i don't know i just like to be fair about it but napoleon you know yeah he did a lot of bad things might have done some you know, good things that brought some, a little bit of progress to humanity as well. I don't have a problem recognizing both of those things, so that's just my take on it. Uh, he couldn't bear to lose face at all. Um, uh, for instance, uh, when, uh, I missed this up, but I'll go back to it, uh, when uh, he marched back into Egypt, he did so in triumph. Oh yes, as though he'd won a great victory. He in fact lost half his army and most of his guns and uh, his ambitions in the in the east had been thwarted. Uh, but in fact, he marched back as if in a victory, and everyone had to wear garlands. Oh, apart from one unit that had persuaded had. Uh, um, uh, behaved very um, unimpressively during an attack on the breach at one point, he forced that unit to, um, to walk back dressed as women. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great man management, isn't it? That's how to get your troops to love you. Um, and uh, when he arrived in Egypt, uh, there, were, uh, there were Egyptians there who uh, had to celebrate his arrival and shower him from, with gifts on pain of death. Yeah. Oh, uh, but he didn't allow Kleber uh, after his victories, uh, any uh, to uh, just to celebrate them at all, just in case his troops, you know, started to you know look up look up to him a bit better. God, Napoleon was such a git. He was such a git. It's extraordinary. Um, anyway, um, uh, so um, uh, Napoleon uh, allies the Russians in 1807. Uh, he was, of course, going to attack them, but they're not standard. He made very peaceful overtures to both the Ottomans and the Mamluks of of Egypt before attacking them. Uh, he just thought, well, how can I increase the chances of surprise? I know, I'll be really nice to them, then attack them. Oh, I'm just such a genius. Or is it a git? It's a git. Um, uh, okay, we got it. <laughs> uh, so he's partitioned Spain and... Um, uh, eventually, yeah, th there was the continental system that uh, he uh, he brought in. Oh dear, another sidetrack. Very quick. Uh, he, he, essentially, the continental system involved uh, telling to uh, saying to everyone in Europe, you can't trade with the British. All these ports are closed. You can't allow the British to trade in any of them. So pfft, to the British, ha ha, that'll bring them to their knees. This nation of shopkeepers. Um, but uh, it didn't actually work because the Royal Navy was very powerful and really frustratingly for, <laughs> for Napoleon, the Royal Navy was just not afraid of him. You see. Napoleon had had cultivated this myth of invincibility, which seemed to really work on his land-based European neighbours. Uh, you know, they were terrified of him, but he just couldn't get this blasted Royal Navy to be frightened of him, which is you know quite understandable on the Royal Navy's part, given that the Royal Navy very consistently beat him easily. Um, anyway, the Royal Navy then just blockaded all the ports and said, OK, fair enough, you're not going to trade with Britain or each other. So what are you going to do about that then? And in 1811, the, the Tsar of Russia just thought, oh, this is ridiculous. And uh, he actually lifted, uh, lifted the uh, embargo and started trading with the British again. And that's possibly the real reason that um, prompted Napoleon to invade Russia. I mean, beyond just wild over ambition. Uh, anyway, so we all know uh, that that didn't go too well. 1812 overture and everything. Uh, the march back of the Grand Army, the, the destruction of the, of the French army, vast, vast, vast numbers of people on both sides dying. But of course, Napoleon was all right. And he, he came back and, um, well, he, he, actually, let's, let's, let's zoom forward because this, uh, there are too many sidelines. This story is getting too big. So let's zoom forward. I just wanted to bring up, I did a video on the 1812 overture that talks about the, you know, what it's about and stuff. And it's about you know, Napoleon's campaign in Russia. Glad he referenced it here. Um, I'll try to put a link to it up here on the corner for you guys if you're interested in checking it out. But uh, we learned about the story behind the 1812 overture. And then we actually listened to a performance of it at the Royal Albert Hall. Or to uh, his imprisonment in Elba. Uh, so in, in Elba, um, uh, he turned up to be uh, taken to uh, exile on the island of Elba. And uh, he, <laughs> the cheek of it, the incredible cheek of it, he demanded that he be escorted by British and transported in a British ship because he feared for his own safety. <laughs> yes, an awful lot of people in France wanted him dead at this point. In fact, an awful lot of people in the world wanted him dead, which was entirely understandable. Even his own brother Lucien really uh, regretted having helped him into power. Um, and uh, he then yeah, demanded th that he be uh, uh, taken there by the British, thank you very much. And when he showed up, 
uh, to be escorted to the, the barge which was going to take him out of the ship. Uh, he stepped out of the carriage and um, trying to you know, look as um, haughty as he could, uh, he um, asked to speak to the captain of the guard. And who was the captain of the guard? It was one Lieutenant Smith. This was <laughs> Sidney Smith's nephew. Oh, and not him. <laughs> history records that at that point his face darkened and he went silent and stayed silent for the rest of the voyage. Anyway, so it was when Napoleon himself wrote his memoirs that he said that it was Sir Sidney Smith who made him miss his destiny. Um, but uh, of course, we all know uh, that the, you know, the final uh, nail in the coffin was Waterloo. So incredibly, incredibly, uh, he was able to come back to power yet again, uh, largely by lying uh, again. Um, well, two, I, two, two reasons that he, he came back to power. Well, one was the, the incredible greed of the army. You see, when Napoleon was uh, in charge of things in, in, in France, he made the army really important, really well funded, really powerful, gave, gave it loads of privileges. And then he sort of destroyed it a bit uh, in campaigns in, in Russia and so forth. Destroyed and uh, it then a the bit. king came back, yet another Louis. And um, the, the, the army lost its power. So when he turned up and went, oh, uh, I'll, I'll give you all your power and privilege back. He went, oh, I'll bring you all power and privilege back. Yay, vive l'empereur. Incredible, isn't it? I mean, he went emperor. He went emperor. He did not king. You look at the portraits done of him at the time when he crowned himself emperor and you can see all oh, the trappings of royalty. The staggering, flagrant hypocrisy of the man. Anyway, um, he also lied to the population. He said that France was in danger and he was the man. He was the man who could save France. Okay, put your faith in me. Give me a massive army. Um, this was a complete lie. The Allies had in fact already signed uh, an alliance treaty guaranteeing the borders of France. No one was there. No one was fighting to conquer France or even a bit of France. The borders were guaranteed. They declared war not on France, but personally on Napoleon. But Napoleon used another lie to convince everyone that he was their saviour and that, they, that he was saving them. No, no, he was trying to get them to save his skin, but hey-ho. He was a liar and he fought the Battle of Waterloo and um, during the battle Sir Sidney was not far away and heard the sound of guns, thought bang, war, what's this? Right, collected a few guys together and uh, went towards the sound of the, uh, the guns and arrived at the battle about halfway through. Uh, he wasn't given a command, a military command in the battle but instead he was given the task of dealing with the wounded of both sides. Um, and uh, as part uh, as of his experience of that he then designed a, a new improved ambulance, a six-wheeled thing with a very smooth ride suspension so that uh, the wounded wouldn't be jostled uh, so much as they were moved at speed across. Okay, so there's like a spring suspension on this too, which would help keep it a little bit steadier. That's interesting. So not only was he a military person, but he kind of like was a bit of a, an engineer, had a bit of a mechanical background it looks like too. I said a lot of people back then, I feel like, you know, they people used to have a lot more like variety of skills back in the day. Across a battlefield um, because uh, he, he wasn't impressed with the design of ambulances that was, uh, ambulance that was being used. Anyway, uh, he was then tasked with uh, getting various places. He got Amiens to surrender and Arras to surrender and he then organized the safe passage of the king into uh, Paris because they had to get the king into Paris without any bloodshed. So he got these various cities to surrender and was able to organize this. And for that, for that, he was given a knighthood, a British knighthood. And so now no one was mocking him for being the, 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 the Swedish knight anymore. Um, uh, so now he was a British knight. And I realize as I get to this stage in, the, uh, in this rambling story that I've missed out quite a lot of uh, uh, other remarkable things about him. Um, uh, he uh, not only did he do uh, lots of uh, uh, useful work in uh, Italy, but um, he did a lot of diplomatic work for loads of people, including uh, King Gustav, who got ousted because he was pro he was an anti-Napoleon uh, monarch, um, uh, and he tried to do more uh, diplomatic work, but tended to get cut out because he um, people saw him as a little bit jumped up. They wanted to be in control, not this other guy. Yeah, he had connections and so forth, and people liked him, but, uh, you know, connections and people liking him. You know, tell me, I'm in charge. Um, so he wasn't tremendously successful, but 
uh, he did uh, mount some campaigns, one of which being he was going to, uh, anti-slavery was going to be one of his big things, and he was going to uh, put together a force to take on the Barbary pirates of North Africa, who had for centuries uh, been capturing people from uh, Mediterranean shipping and raids on the coast that went as far as Ireland and Cornwall, uh, whole villages uh, of, of people captured and sold into slavery by the Barbary pirates, and he was going to take them on. I think uh, John Adams was president of the United States when the U.S. first had to kind of deal with the Barbary pirates, if I remember. And then he, I think it, I think he was a bit passive towards them, I believe. Like he didn't really want to confront them. And then Thomas Jefferson got elected president and Jefferson had a much more aggressive foreign policy with the pirates. I think he sent uh, some American ships over to deal with them. I don't remember all the details about it, but I do remember that much, I think. Um, I think I, I think that's right. But that's interesting that uh, maybe they encountered Sidney Smith during all of that. And it is said by some historians that he invented something. He invented the charity dinner. Now, it strikes me as unlikely that he exactly it was the first person ever to do anything like that. But certainly, uh, for his day, it was a novel thing. Uh, so perhaps in the, in the way we know it today, the, the modern charity dinner was invented. You sell tickets and get loads of people uh, to spend a very large amount of money on these expensive tickets and they make speeches telling each other just how wonderful they are to raise money uh, to take on the Barbary pirates. Uh, but then it was actually Napoleon coming to, uh, back into power again and interrupted things. And there you go. I missed that out, but I've got to be. So, uh, so Sidney Smith. Um, the Wheel of Fortune uh, for Napoleon turned, and it seems that this man, not, not maybe not Wellington, not maybe not Blucher, not maybe not Nelson, not maybe any of those, those you know, the Russian guys, um, whose names unfortunately I um, failed to learn for this, uh, this video. Yes, perhaps he wasn't any of those. Like, it, it might have been, of course, you know. But in Napoleon's rather suspicious mind, it was Sir Sidney Smith. <laughs> What is this outro? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, he does not like Napoleon. All right, that was really interesting. I feel like half of that uh, kind of like lecture was just a rant about how much he hated Napoleon. <laughs> uh, at least I have a better idea of what his views are on certain things. There's so much that happened and all of that is hard to like sort it out in my head. It was a nice little inside look at some, some just like little moments, you know, like him running into Sidney Smith's brother as he's being escorted to Elba. Uh, you know, the letter that, that Smith sent to him. I thought that the ambulance that Smith uh, design was really interesting. I didn't know that they called them ambulances back in the day because you know I think of an ambulance as like a motorized, a motorized ambulance like we know now. I just uh, didn't know that they had them back then obviously in more of like carriage form but and uh, you know he went over some things like the continental system for instance I do remember from the Epic History TV videos you know I, I remember that the Royal Navy just was so big that uh, it was impossible for them to be completely cut off from trade. I mean they could just circumvent the Napoleon in that sense. It was interesting that he thought that one of the reasons Napoleon invaded Russia was because of that, because they decided to start trading with Britain again, which might have been brought up in Epic History TV, but it's hard to, you know, remember every single point that was brought up. But that was uh, an interesting interesting thing to point out. So yeah, I appreciate you guys recommending Lindy Beige. I actually have another Patreon request from a different patron who has another Lindy Beige video that they wanted me to watch. So it'll probably be coming up in a few days time because I do want to give a little bit of space between these two, but at least I've had a nice little intro into Lindy Beige. So I appreciate the suggestions I'm on, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video too. If you did, like and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. And as I mentioned, my Patreon link is in the description and pen comment if you're interested in going and checking out all of the stuff we have over there. You know, Blackadder, Horrible Histories, The World at War, Dad's Army. We're getting into People Century now, and then of course a few movies from Movie Night. So you can go check that stuff out over there. Also have my Star Trek podcast link in there as well. If you're a Trekkie, you might want to go check that out. Social media, all of that stuff is down there. And that's it for Napoleon's Greatest Foe. Stay tuned for more content like this coming up, and we'll see you next time.